Today I'd like to share a personal journey with you. It's a bit of a diversion from my usual sort of subjects that I do on this channel. And I want to share with you my thought processes um, concerning evolution and genetic laws. And uh, it's one of those things that I, I came to in my 20s uh, in that I had been presented with a certain view of the world um, and you know I found certain information which caused me to challenge those things and challenge those assumptions. I can remember at school although we were uh, you know taken to church on a regular basis uh, at school I was presented with uh, you know evidence for evolution and um, you know I sort of accepted what I was told because it was given to me by teachers but you know as a young mind I didn't really assess or think through or challenge many of that uh, much of that information you know and um, it's interesting one of the things that I was presented with was this from a school textbook it's quite a famous well-known um, thought process or piece of evidence which is often uh, presented uh, whereby the uh, peppered moths in uh, in certain areas were of a light color until the industrial revolution when there was a lot of soot and smoke so the trees went black and so the light colored moths were picked off by predators because they were easily spotted and the dark moths thrived and took over the population then when the uh, revolution was over and less soot was used then of course the process reversed and the moths went light as the trees went light and this was presented to me as evidence of evolution but I had cause to challenge that when I was in my 20s and I began to realize that there was a difference between evolution within a species and evolution of a new species okay um, the the thing is that uh, you have adaptation and, and if it's deliberately selected then you have breeding uh, which can be uh, to enhance certain features of an animal or a plant um, and this is well observed this is every day this is normal this is from generation to generation I look different from my father my son looks different from me and there's changes on every generation but the thing is that's quite different from the idea of the evolution of a brand new animal and this is one of the things which I, I want to differentiate between because there's uh, much information out there and much evidence is cited as proof and actually it's not analysed or really evaluated. Now I want to make the point before I actually get into this of saying that this was a thought process that I went through as an atheist, as an unbeliever in that sense, um, and my interest was in science, my interest was in genetics and fossils and geology, my interest was in the evidence and uh, you know as an unbeliever I rejected biblical arguments you know I had Christians who said to me ah but the Bible says that this that and the other and I didn't respect the Bible and so therefore I paid no heed and so it's very important that um, you understand that my thought process was that of an atheist and I was only interested in science and uh, you know it, it's one of those things which is very important and with any hypothesis with any theory it must be assessed on the evidence now as evidence is verified and checked then we need to actually understand that if there's evidence against our theory then we reject that theory uh, you know the proposal that something is is such and such or you know that if you find evidence against it then it must be rejected and so therefore you know if we um, don't have any proof for a theory then we may still theorize but it's not proven it's not a fact it's just a theory it's an idea uh, and so therefore we need to actually check the evidence and, and see what's left whatever is left however unlikely is the truth provided there's no evidence against it um, so, you know, it's one of those things whereby uh, we look at evolution, we look at genetic laws, and we need to understand how species uh, are actually defined. Now, adaptation for one thing, macroevolution, evol or you know, changes within a species is actually quite common and normal, uh, but it's often cited as being evolution of a new species. For example, when the peppered moth changed colour, they say, oh, it's a new species. No, it is not a new species. It is the same species, but it's changed a bit. 
Okay. Uh, I remember there was a, a classic example with um, the wolves. Uh, yeah, I think it was in Canada, and the wolves uh, were culled, killed off by hunters. Um, nobody took any notice of the coyotes because they were smaller, they were a pest, but they weren't dangerous, and so they were ignored. And uh, then there was an ecological gap into which the coyotes grew to fill that gap for larger as larger predators and they became larger and stronger and this was acclaimed as being a new species but they're not it was just coyotes but bigger okay this is not a new animal they didn't become wolves they became like wolves but they were still they were still coyotes and this is really important to understand the distinction because many of the things which are decided oh yes there's a new animal it's arisen because of this that and the other and actually no it hasn't it's not a new animal it's a new variety of that animal it's a new breed of that animal just like you have different breeds with dogs different breeds with cats they may have more fur or longer tails or bigger or smaller or different qualities different patterns uh, they may run faster but it's still the same animal uh, just a different breed and this is the understanding that, that breed is not the same as species looking at the peppered moth of course this was was cited as an example and actually it's not a new moth it's a same moth with a different pattern on the on the feathers or feathers scales um, uh, <laughs> but the the thing is that actually of course that reverted when the situation changed again All right now to understand this we need to start thinking about the laws of genetic reproduction we need to start thinking about definitions okay now two animals are considered to be the same species if they can have fertile offspring now that's a key word it's fertile offspring not just offspring and I'm distressed to see that in a textbook recently I looked at the definition and they would taken the word fertile out um, and it provoked me um, because I thought that's not accurate it's because somebody has seen that actually genetics disprove evolution and therefore they've took out the awkward bit of information you know and that's 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 not honest that's really not honest okay now two horses you Stalin and a mare um, they can breed and they will have a foal that will be fertile and can go on and breed again two donkeys can breed they will have fertile offspring but if I cross a horse and a donkey I end up with a very distinctive animal called a mule okay they can breed so they can have offspring but it's a mule and the distinctive feature of a mule is this it is infertile it cannot reproduce again okay likewise with birds my father-in-law has finches uh, he breeds finches he also breeds canaries but he can also trick them by putting them into a, a cage in a certain arrangement so he ends up with a canary crossing with a with a finch he ends up with what they call a mule and he likes it because it sings very very well um, but the thing is it's infertile he can't then breed more mules he, to breed another mule he has to get a finch and a canary together again and so therefore that's the end of the line and this is a very important principle this is a very simple principle and it's well observed as well you'll notice that this is not you know really complicated uh, science certainly not yet um, but you know there is the evidence and these things are well known anybody who's who's bred mules have done that for for centuries you know same with the birds everybody knows this they're infertile they can't go further forward so you don't have a new species you don't get any future with that so you know you have to understand that this is a very important principle because you know with the animals that are made in pairs then you can fill the earth but if you cross breed animals or plants you end up at the end of the line and that's the end of it and so that means that you can't get a new species all you can get is more finches and more finches and more finches but you can't get more mules now to look at the science a little bit more closely this is because they have the same number of chromosomes there's a little bit more to it than that they have to match in other ways but we're just going to keep it simple and just look at the number of chromosomes in their DNA okay now DNA actually looks something like that obviously that's not a particularly accurate picture but you get the idea and they usually to make them easier to understand they're usually laid out like this on a chart okay this is a human um, chromosome uh, layout you know and you have XX for female and XY for male 
but otherwise they're all laid out like this. And you notice there's 23 pairs and they have 46 chromosomes. Okay, they're always in pairs. And that's important as well. And uh, sometimes they're laid out in a chart like this uh, so that you can recognize it. Um, and you may have seen other associated similar charts like DNA fingerprints and that kind of stuff. You'll notice it's all represented in lines so that they're easy to analyze and easy to uh, understand. Now, when you actually look at this, this is very important because the male and the female have to have the same number of chromosomes in order to have fertile offspring. Okay, that is what marks them out as being on the same species. If they have a different number of chromosomes, there's a mismatch. They may have offspring, but it will be a mule. And because that mule has a mismatch within its DNA, it cannot reproduce. Okay, it cannot have more offspring. And this is very important. For example, if I have a donkey which has 62 and a horse which has 64, you'll notice that they're fairly close but we can crossbreed them, we will end up with a mule. Okay. If it's a female, then it's actually called a hinny, which may breed, but it has to go back with another donkey or another horse in order to breed, and the DNA will revert. So you don't get a new species, you don't get a new animal. Okay. You still end up with either a donkey or a horse. Okay. Uh, so there's this fail-safe within the genetics to make sure that there are no new species um, species arising. Okay, you end up with more donkeys or more horses, um, and so everything is undone in this case. Humans likewise have 23 pairs, 46, uh, whereas gorillas have 48. Okay, um, and the thing is that actually, you know, you might think, oh, there might be a hybrid there, you know, if anybody actually wanted to do that scientifically. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing is, you would just end up with a mule and there would be no further forward. Um, what's interesting is actually primates generally supposedly are all related according to evolutionists, uh, yet our DNA varies from 20 to 62. Okay, That's a vast range and it actually indicates that we're not related. Now I can forgive Darwin for looking at a, an animal you know, it's got five fingers, two arms, two legs, and a head. Uh, it looks fairly similar to a human, so therefore maybe it's related. I can forgive that, because Darwin didn't know about DNA. Okay, But when we actually look into the DNA of all primates who are supposedly related, there is such a vast range of DNA. It shows that we're not related, that actually we were made independently. And th this is something that we need to understand uh, about these chromosome numbers. I know it's more complicated than that. I'm just keeping it simple, um, just to see that to to show that uh, you know th there's no real basis in genetic laws for evolution. You know, now sterility that means that they can't breed in a hybrid. That's a cross between two different types of animals. Uh, it's often the result of the chromosomal number. Okay. So if you have parents of differing chromosomes, like a donkey and a horse, 62 and 64, the offspring will have an odd number of chromosomes, which means that they cannot produce chromosomally balanced gametes. That means that they can't reproduce. All right? And this is really important. Okay, So that's a posh way of putting it. I hope that I've explained it more simply than that. But if you want the actual terms that are important, then uh, please do. And please look that up and, and check those definitions and understanding. Now it's not just the numbers, as I was saying, it is more complicated. I'm not going to look into it, but just to point out that there are many other animals with 46 chromosomes, okay? So, um, you know, it's not just about the numbers, but there's so much stuff put out about DNA, um, which is, uh, you know, sort of put out as if, as if it's true, you know, um, as if it's evidence for evolution, you know, and I'm sure that the facts themselves are true, but then the conclusion that people draw from those is often a little bit off. For example, we share 50% of our DNA with bananas, okay, that's fine, but are we half bananas? The fact that we share a lot of DNA with gorillas or other similar primates does not mean that we have developed from them or that, that we have developed from a common ancestor. Okay, we are not half bananas, you know. There is some evidence around that there are possible hybrids like that, but I don't think that any of us would take that seriously. So, looking at human evolution, let's consider how this might actually happen. Okay, let's say we've got a primate called Charlie, and we've got another primate called 
Charlotte. Okay, and Charlie and Charlotte. Now, I know that evolutionary theory does not propose that we came from gorillas. Um, it's that gorillas and humans and other primates all came from common ancestors. Okay, but unfortunately, there aren't any pictures available of those animals. Um, so I'm just going to go with Charlie and Charlotte just for the sake of demonstrating this point. And by some genetic freak, these two have a child who has got 46 chromosomes, um, you know, and so here's the first human. We could call him Adam, or we could call him Tarzan. I'm going to call him Tarzan for the moment. And, um, you know, this, this, this Tarzan creature is a little bit different, okay? He's got a different number of chromosomes. It's just a genetic accident. Now, that's possible, although it's not been observed in, in nature. Uh, it is possible. Uh, it's a theory, and there's no proof against it, so therefore we can still accept it as a theory. But then we have to think about, okay, we've overcome this hurdle. Now, what next? What happens when Tarzan comes to maturity? Where's Jane? He needs somebody to pair up with in order to have more humans. How does a human race continue from one child from one specimen okay how does a human race continue how do they multiply okay now this is a problem because he's the first human the whole point is that there are no other humans so where is Jane going to come from you know this is the end of the line there is no future for the human race because he hasn't got a mate to pair up with all right now he could go back to his parents breed go back to another gorilla and try to multiply but of course what will happen then they've got a mismatch in their DNA this is our point he's a new species he's got a different DNA count that's what makes him a new species he's not just a gorilla with no hair as Darwin thought or some have thought you know he's a new species he's got a different DNA count so when he pairs up with one of his parents relatives what happens well he ends up with a mule and you see, what is that? That's the end of the line. Please forgive the historical reference to the newspaper from the time of Darwin. Okay, um, You know, it's one of those things whereby whichever way you look at it, you end up in a dead end. Uh, there are no other humans for him, and he can't go back with a gorilla. Well, he could, but he'd end up with a mule. And so therefore there's no future for the human race. And this is the same for every species. You've got a lot of hurdles to overcome, you know, and this is the thing whereby, you know, you have to start to think, well, how does that work? How does this happen? And the answer is, it can't. Now, this is where, you know, we have to start thinking about, like, why do people believe in evolution? And the answer is they want to. They want to. And they'll gloss over these gaps in the evidence uh, or in the, the think, you know, th thought process, you know, uh, they will gloss over these gaps and, and fill in the spaces um, and just say, yeah, it, it just happened like that. Oh, it happened over millions of years, that's the favourite. Um, it still has to happen in one generation. Giving it millions of years doesn't make it any more likely because if something's impossible, you can do it for a billion years, it's still not going to happen uh, because it's got to overcome these hurdles. The other alternative, you know, as, as an atheist, I, I started to think, like, you know, how do I get around this? There must be another way forward, you know. And maybe it's Charlie and Charlotte have got some kind of genetic combination that causes them to have human babies. And so maybe they'd have a couple of girls and a couple of boys, and um, they could crossbreed. But the problem is, then you come up against incest. Uh, you know, when you have brothers and sisters crossbreeding, then you end up with all sorts of issues, in particular infertility. Uh, so again, it's like there are fail-safes built within the DNA in order to stop that from happening. All right, And of course, that's a real problem for evolution. It's not a problem for the biblical account because we're dealing with a different scenario. Uh, we'll come to talk to that, about that afterwards. But the evolutionary um, route has to follow the genetic laws which have been observed and it's been observed again and again that when you crossbreed within close relatives including with animals and humans then indeed you end up with more and more problems you don't end up with a strong new species okay um, you see and there are other problems okay for a start off just thinking about this in practical terms when Tarzan is born um, you know, that he's going to look like a runt because he's going to be a bit different. 
uh, and the response of most animals is to kill or abandon the runt. Okay, uh, They don't look at them and think, oh, this could be a next step forward. In fact, they do the opposite. And in fact, for evolution to, w to work, surely we would find different children um, or different offspring uh, more of an advantage. Uh, and it's interesting that actually humans are the only creatures who protect their disabled offspring. Uh, almost without exception, animals will kill a runt or they'll just abandon them. And um, of course, you actually have to think about these things. You know, the, the changes in animals would actually really be normally seen as deformities, even amongst humans, you know. And that means that differences would make you um, attractive, you know. You know, it, it's, it doesn't make any, th any sense. Because actually, in normal terms, normal is perfect and beautiful. You know, if somebody has a nose which is too big, they look ugly. If it's too small, they look ugly. Uh, so it has to be just right, it has to be average, perfect size in order to be attractive. Now, say, um, you know, you had a son who was born and he had a nose that was 10 inches long. Um, you know, imagine him as a teenager. Do you think all the girls are going to be flocking around him and thinking, this could be the next step in our evolution? Maybe he's going to develop a, a stronger sense of smell, you know? Um, because this whole thing with evolution is supposedly these things develop slowly, but the problem is before they actually develop, they've actually got to go through a development stage, and usually they're just deformities. Um, if we developed a third eye in the middle of our forehead, um, you know, somebody with a, a third eye, it would not be attractive. You know, it would look weird, and we're revolted by it in some ways, you know. And this is the problem with people who think like evolutionists. Now, as a as a creationist, you may look at somebody and say, look, it doesn't matter what they look like because they're a child of God, and so therefore you love them. Uh, but as an evolutionist, surely you'd look at these things and, you know, it contradicts evolutionary thinking, the fact that people don't find differences attractive. Okay, And uh, it's interesting that the changes that we do see are very rarely advantageous. They're usually a problem. Um, you know, the, you know, we look at uh, sickle cell. Uh, it may have some advantages, but generally speaking, it, it makes the uh, the sufferer a lot weaker. Okay, we don't immediately think, oh, it could be a step forward. You know, um, and so therefore, you know, we need to think about what this really means and really examine this so-called evidence and actually reassess it. Okay, it's also interesting that changes are usually a loss of DNA information, and that there's an underlying thing called RNA, which actually will reverse changes in the next generation. Um, fruit flies that were exposed to radiation, they deformed and they changed, they grew extra wings, and you might think, oh well, extra wings, they could fly faster, but they couldn't because they just got in each other's way. Um, the the wings just clashed and and different things, uh, but afterwards when the radiation stopped. As the fruit flies continued to multiply, the RNA reversed the changes and they went back to normal. Okay, And so therefore it's interesting that actually there are fail-safes within DNA and genetic reproduction to help that. Uh, now under creation, all creatures are designed and made by God. And uh, animals are different from men in that man is uh, made in the image of God, but physically we share a lot of common uh, ground. Um, but the thing is, you see, if everything's created by God, then he has the right to set morals and to change them. Okay. Um, now, under evolution, everything's come about by a fight for survival, uh, a fight to the death, uh, and we've risen to the top simply because we're clever. Not because we're made in the image of God, but because we're simply clever. Okay. And so, therefore, we should be very proud of who we are, um, and indeed, uh, many people are. Okay. It also means that there are no set morals. Uh, because there's no God to answer to, there's no one to give an account to. Um, and it raises certain problems, because why do animals that have evolved through a fight for survival have a conscience? It's very interesting, isn't it? Because we seem to have a conscience. Um, people might argue about whether or not animals do, but certainly human beings have a moral conscience we know when we've done something wrong and this has been something that you know many evolutionary thinking uh, think tanks have, have tried to get to the bottom of this they've tried to think of it as a way of looking at it as community survival 
and so if you do damage to somebody then therefore you feel bad about what you've done because you've damaged the community um, but they, these theories really don't stand up and they're a little bit nebulous you know they're, they're interesting to read and I, I suggest that you look at them but they're not really very strong you know whereas under creation then you have a much firmer line you have somebody who's set uh, the boundaries and you know when we break those boundaries then our conscience kicks in you know it's it's very interesting when you think about for example um, the practicalities of, of as we've laid it out with human evolution um, sometimes when you know you admit that you're a creationist people say what you think the whole world was populated from two people and I think well that's better than evolution because according to evolution it was populated from one and um, you know the last time I looked it takes two you know it, it's one of those basic uh, things that you know according to evolution the whole world was populated from one there was a while ago that they realized that everybody on earth had actually descended from one person who they nicknamed mitochondrial Eve oddly enough and I remember when this was first discovered there was somebody on the being interviewed and um, they said oh yes but there were lots of other breeding females around at the time and I think like well where did they come from Sure, the whole point is that you're talking about who was the first human, but where did these other humans come from? They've just been bought out of nowhere, a rabbit out of the hat, you know. And people have problems with the idea that uh, Adam and Eve would be the first two people, and then therefore their children must have interbred, um, and their children must have interbred again, and in order to fill the earth. And people have a problem with this because, of course, we've been conditioned by centuries of thinking that incest is wrong, correctly so, because that's what's laid out in the Bible. But it's not a problem because uh, the law was written by God, okay? And before the law was written, then it was not wrong for brothers and sisters to go together. The law was written in the time of Moses in Leviticus 18. And uh, this, is, this is very important to understand, such as Abraham, he was married to his half-sister, and there were many others who were married to close relatives. And this was perfectly normal before the law was passed under Moses. You know, it's only illegal after the law is passed. And so therefore, before that, it was perfectly OK and it was perfectly natural. However, after Moses, it is not. And it's interesting that that even extends to animals, um, that even if you in interbreed animals, then you end up with more and more problems. Evolution, however, has to stick to that genetic law right the way back to the beginning, because that's just an observed fact. With genetics okay it's not the case with the Bible but it is the case with the evolutionary theory because at what point did that come in you know um, we have an answer but you know the thing is that you have to go to the Bible to find that answer however somebody who's an evolutionist cannot answer the fact that incest must be the case because in fact of course the whole world is populated from one person from our first man Tarzan, as we called him in our chart. Survival of the fittest raises up all sorts of moral problems, and this is something that people who believe in evolution don't usually want to confront. Okay, according to evolution, of course, you know, uh, we we've got to the top by fighting and killing our competitors, and so therefore mu murder should be natural, and adultery is right because all we are doing is is is, uh, you know increasing our, our our personal uh survival within the gene pool you know now it's a very interesting that actually if we all got here to the top of the tree by being killers surely we should celebrate people who are natural killers actually only two percent of people are natural killers and only a small proportion of those ever actually go on to kill um it's also interesting to notice that personally speaking as an ex-soldier I was very intrigued by the uh, by the fact that many soldiers struggle after they've been to war now nearly always this is portrayed as being the fact that they have suffered and so therefore they've got post-traumatic stress disorder but actually what really underlies it the real problem is what they have done to other people 
Um, it's killing somebody else that really eats somebody alive. It gives them nightmares and they can't sleep. And this is the thing that, where does that conscience come from? Why is it that 99% of soldiers struggle with the fact that they've killed somebody? Even though they're justified in being there, even though they're trained to do it, even though they, they've reasoned with themselves and they've put themselves there as volunteers, nevertheless they can't live with it afterwards. It's also interesting to think that racism is right, um, you know, because you're eliminating the competition. Okay, genetic traits are incurable, so if somebody's what they are because of their genetics, uh, you know, I was born this way, well, they're incurable, so therefore there's no point in treating them or helping them, you may as well just wipe them out, eliminate them from the gene pool, you know. And this leads to things like ethnic cleansing, you know. Um, eugenics was something that Darwin was very much into, and the positive end of eugenics, it's choosing the best genetics. You know, as a farmer, you may choose the cow that produces the most milk and breed from that so that you get more cows that produce more milk. That That's fine. You know, but what happens to the ones that you reject? You know, now we're fine with, with slaughtering animals because, of course, we do that anyway. Uh, but what if we start to apply that to people? And, in fact, under eugenics theory, then it was even proposed that certain parts of the population be stopped from having children uh, and eliminated, you know, and other parts of the, co uh, of the population should be encouraged to breed. And Hitler took that to its logical conclusion and we see the logical conclusion of evolutionary thinking in Nazi Germany and in Nazi thinking. Um, Hitler had um, institutions where they treated disabled children uh, and you know what that means don't you? They didn't come out. Um, the, the thing was because they were seen as genetically inferior. Now as a human being I'm appalled by that as a Christian, I'm utterly appalled by it, and the thing is that this is why I feel so strongly about evolution. People say, oh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, yes, it does, big time, okay? Because under evolution, then animals and humans just have the same value. So therefore, if they've finished their useful life, or if they have no use for them, why not just wipe them out? Uh, you know, how can I eat an animal if I can't eat a human? So therefore, if I can eat an animal, then maybe I should just be a cannibal. You know, it leads to all sorts of problems. Now, 90% of the time, people who are evolutionists will not think that way and they won't follow it through to its natural conclusion. But many do. And you see that very much in, in Nazi thinking, you know, with Mein Kampf or My Struggle. Uh, you know, we see that Adolf Hitler uh, pursued that to its natural conclusion and it leads to a lot of problems and this is one of the things that I believe that actually evolutionary thinking is behind the breakdown of society and the breakdown of the family, the building block of society and it's behind a lack of faith in God and it's led to nothing but problems left, right and centre. It's destroying society as we know, it's destroying the world. And we really do need to think about that because at the end of the day we need to recognise that we have been created. Um, I'll share a personal story with you. Um, I became a believer because as an atheist I looked through evolutionary thinking and looked through genetic reproduction and the laws thereof and I realised that evolution was actually impossible. It's interesting how often um, it's portrayed, the struggle between creationism and evolution is often portrayed as religion versus uh, science. And what's interesting is for me, I looked at it as an atheist, I looked at the science, and the science led me to faith. Okay, And th that's very important that science is not against religion. Science will actually lead you to faith. And I think that that's an important distinction to make, to understand that thought process. It's as an atheist, I realised that evolution was impossible. You see, it takes faith to believe in something for which there's no evidence. Okay. OK, I have no absolute proof that there's a God. It takes faith to believe that there's a God. OK, I think I've seen enough evidence, and I believe I've experienced enough to know that there is a God, but that's in my heart. I can't prove that to you. I can't give you that, as it were, in a formula to prove to you that there's a God. But nevertheless, it takes faith to believe in something for which there's no evidence. But where is the evidence for evolution? 
I look through geology, I look through fossils, which actually do not prove evolution, they just prove that animals existed, and they prove that actually um, quite the opposite, because one of the things that really appalled me was when I looked at the tree of life and, and I looked at the fossil record, I saw that uh, many evolutionists actually move fossils from where they're found to a different layer in order to fit their evolutionary thinking. Uh, that's another study in itself. But the thing is that it takes faith to believe in evolution because there is no evidence for it. And in fact, I'll go a step further. What does it take? If it takes faith to believe in something you have no evidence for, what does it take to believe in something for which there is evidence disproving it? I believe that takes a stubborn mind. And that's what I realised I had. Because I realised I was believing in something because I wanted to even though the evidence was against it. And I'll tell you a couple of stories. Because my father was a doctor, I had family friends, or we had family friends, who were well-educated, shall we say. They went to top universities. And one of them um, lived near me where I was when I was going through this thought process as, uh, before I was ever a believer. And uh, he was a professor of paleontology. I thought this man knows he's written books he's got the alphabet after his name um, and I knew this man quite well as a family friend and I went to see him and I asked him the question how do I prove evolution and he said oh no nobody will ever prove evolution and the bottom dropped out of my world I th this was my last ditch attempt to find somebody who would say right it's like this because I thought I'm I'm looking in the wrong place or something I must have missed something and here was a man who was a professor of paleontology telling me that he was a creationist. And uh, it just floored me, just floored me. So I did become a believer. And um, a while after I became a believer, I, I told my mother, my mother was, was very shocked. She said, you've always been a Christian because you went to church as a child. Uh, I said, no, I haven't been a Christian. I, I'm only a Christian if I follow Jesus. And uh, I haven't been following Jesus. And she offered me a free holiday. She said, let's go and see uh, an old family friend, um, another friend of my father's, in America. I thought, great, free holiday to America. So off we went to Virginia and we went to Washington. We, we met this family and we had a great time. And um, my mother, after a few days, brought the subject of evolution up. And I was expecting, and I think she was expecting, this old man to take me to pieces and show me how we should believe in evolution and you know I just prayed and I said Lord help me and this old gentleman sat back and he said you know something when I was at college with your father he said this kind of debate raged you know between evolutionary uh, thinking and uh, creation and uh, an interesting thing happened once there was a, a physics student uh, who was very ardent as a creationist and a biology student who was equally keen on evolution and the physics student made a working model of the solar system for an exhibition and it worked, you turned a handle and all the pulleys and levers worked and so the planets span around the sun and the biology student saw it and exclaimed how fantastic it was, it's amazing he said, how did you make it? And the physics student said, oh, it was easy. He said, I threw a handful of dust into the room, went off, made a cup of tea, came back, and there it was up and running. And he said, this is one of the things he said. I, I train young doctors. They come out of top-notch universities, Yale and Harvard. And, um, you know, they really know their stuff, and um, they're very confident in their own ability. And he said, and there's one fundamental error that underpins their thinking. He says, they forget that we've been created by a loving God. And my mother's face went the colour of snow and she looked like she was going to fall off her chair. Um, she'd paid for that lovely holiday and this man here was a creationist. And it goes to show that there are men who are well educated, who know their stuff, who understand the science um, and they believe in creation. And sometimes they're silenced by the pressures of other people. Uh, the media is dominated by people who believe in evolution. Um, but don't be brainwashed. You know, Look at the evidence. Consider what does it actually say. Remember, fossils come out of the ground, but they don't come out with a label saying this was buried in such and such a place or such and such a time. You know, And we need to think about the fact that, you know, really, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
you know, uh, there's more information on DNA than there is in all the computers in the whole world put together in just one cell. That didn't come about by chance. It can't have. You know, I only have to look at the watch on my wrist to see that it's been made because it's working, you know. And this is the thing, look at the evidence, see what it really says, see what the evidence truly is. And remember that we're created by a loving God. And this is really important because we have to understand that the whole universe is based on a foundation of wisdom and justice and that all things will come to judgment. And he's not willing that we should perish. He loves us and he sent his son to die on the cross and to rise again and to ascend to heaven to open up a way for us to have a relationship with him and he wants that and we deny him that because we go in search of freedom um, you know uh, we think that adultery is right and that murder is right and, and that racism is right and these are the things which underpin all this thinking and we don't realize that actually it's just a road to slavery the only freedom is found in the truth and I looked at DNA and I looked at genetics and I looked at evolution and I reassessed the geology and the fossil record and all the evidence and what I found was the truth and I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that the truth will set you free. Bless you all. Please consider what I've said. I shared it from my heart. I know it's not the usual subject that I normally share on here but I really wanted to share it because it was my process it was my path to the cross um, although it's got nothing to do with the Bible as such although it wasn't a process that I went through I didn't read the Bible until after I got saved as such I um, went through this thought process as an atheist I looked at the evidence I looked at the science and the question is can you be honest about the evidence or will you just believe what you want to believe um, and I suggest if you are a believer and you have friends who believe in evolution, then please do share this video with them and send them also my contact details. Uh, you can get hold of me, my email. I'd be only too glad to engage anybody in a conversation. God bless you all. Thank you.